to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? I hope you've all had a great week. Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, and this week I am very happy to tell you I have an interview with Tudemista, probably one of my favourite people on Twitter, somebody I've been following for a while, somebody I've always wanted to sit down and have a chat with, and we managed to do it last week in San Francisco. But before I tell you about the interview, I've got a message from my show sponsors. Please do listen to this, please do check them out as they enable me to keep this show going. So, firstly, crypto investors in the US, I want to introduce you to Equity Trust. They can educate you on the possibilities of protecting your profits as it is possible to mitigate taxes by investing in cryptocurrency with your IRA. With a self-directed IRA, you can invest in Bitcoin and other crypto in a potentially tax-deferred or tax-free way. If this sounds interesting to you, then you can discover more by visiting trustetc.com slash crypto. They have a free guide which will explain the potential benefits and possibilities for you to invest in a tax-advantaged environment. Get your guide now at trustetc.com slash crypto. Next up, I also want to tell you about Casa. You might be aware of them from my interview with Jameson Lopp. He moved to them recently, and I've been following them since the interview. When Bitcoin has enabled individuals to be their own bank for nearly a decade... There are many people who are either choosing to use trusted third parties out of convenience or finding out the hard way that they did not sufficiently prepare to be a bank. Casa enables you to secure your private keys without having to convert your home into a physical fortress. The multi-signature, multi-device, multi-location architecture keeps you safe against theft, disaster and even negligence. That means Casa also helps with inheritance procedure, passing your crypto wealth to your heirs with keys in their control. Let Casa guide you through the high learning curve of key management in order to avoid unforeseen pitfalls. Find out more and apply for Casa at keys.casa. That is K-E-Y-S dot C-A-S-A. Okay, so on to the interview. Firstly, I want to say Tua is without doubt the nicest person I have ever interviewed. I was going up to San Francisco to do the interview from L.A., And when I got to my hotel, I realized I'd left all my recording equipment uh, back in L.A. It was uh, quite late and I dropped in a message just to apologize, asking to reschedule. And uh, rather than than reschedule, he came back to me with suggestions and actually started looking at places for us to hire equipment, which was obviously very nice of him. But luckily, we were managed to uh, find a studio that we could use at Blockchain Capital. So I have to say thank you to Spencer for allowing us to use that. Um, But yeah, uh, Tua was just uh, such a nice guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him i think you'll see what i mean i've wanted to talk to him for a long time Uh, i've been aware he has a long history in bitcoin and in preparing for the interview i went out and read everything he had written he's uh, he's written a bunch of posts on medium not loads but he's over time he's written like many many useful posts so i went through them all but interestingly there was this article in the middle where he talks about separating himself from his family And as I knew I was going to encourage everyone to go and read all his Medium posts, I did ask him if we could talk about this because, you know, I I knew other people would be aware of this uh, article and he was happy to. So when this interview starts, you're you're going to see that we're going to be talking about this. And um, yeah, I I recommend going to check out the article. I'll share it in the show notes. But we do also talk about Bitcoin. We do get into other things about the state of the economy and why Bitcoin is so important and some of the predictions he originally made for Ethereum. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this interview also please do support the show if you can leave me a review on itunes a five-star review if you think i deserve it they all help i do see it when uh, you guys message me to say you've done it and i appreciate it every single time please also follow me on social media i'm on twitter instagram steam it medium everywhere my handle is always at what bitcoin did feel free also to reach out to me please check out my website i've mentioned it needs a bit of work i'm going to be doing an overhaul soon i think a number of my opinions have changed on things so i need to update that but uh, yeah check out my website on www whatbitcoindid.com also feel free to email me my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and please do share this out with your friends and family please do stick it up on twitter and let everyone else know about this uh, interview i see it every time you do it and i'm i'm always very grateful okay so on to the interview i hope you enjoy it if you do have any questions do feel free to reach out to me as i said my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and i pretty much reply to anyone so do feel free to reach out to me okay i hope you enjoy the interview Morning, Arthur. How are you? Hi, Peter. Good morning. Thank you for agreeing to come on the podcast. We've uh, avoided a disaster with recording equipment, so <laughs> we owe a big thank you to Spencer this morning. So, um, how are you? Doing great, thanks. I've um, I've, I've known about you for a, a, quite a while. You've obviously somebody who stands out within Bitcoin, and I say loosely crypto, but within Bitcoin. Um, 
And when I last interviewed Jameson Lopp, he suggested I come and meet you and talk to you about economics of Bitcoin. But I've also been doing my own research. And as I said to you before we started, I went through your Medium post and I actually found this very interesting post where you talked about separating yourself from your family. And I know it's a strange start because we're here to talk about Bitcoin, but um, that article seemed to resonate with a lot of people. So if you don't mind, I'd like to explore that. But where did that come from? What happened? Um, yeah, I guess it's a hard thing to like to like summarize. I, I would say it's 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 it was the 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 end. I guess it was a step in a long process that is still ongoing. Where I was thinking about you know my my personal life and my relationships and and also my personal health, like emotional health, physical health. Um, and so it was something really, you know, it, it, before I made that decision to separate myself from, you know, you could say from my family of origin or from my family uh, where I grew up was, uh, it was, I would say 10 years went by where I was, you know, trying to, trying to mend things or trying to um, kind of come to uh, a, um, a relationship that would have some balance and where I would feel good. And it just, it kept not working out. And so eventually I, I considered, you know, making that big step of like, you know, living my life independently and, and really deliberately choosing uh, who would be a part of my life and who wouldn't. And so uh, it, you know, it involved a lot of therapy. It involved a lot of, um, you know, thinking a lot of like, um, I mean, it, 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 I, I think, yeah, it's, it was definitely the hardest decision that I've ever made. It was, it was really, uh, really tough, but in hindsight, I still feel that um, it's, it was a good decision and I don't consider it to be something that I can never, you know, I can never reverse, like, there's a, I can always decide next month or next year that I do want to reach out to them or that I, you know, I want to uh, try something. Uh, but but as far as my personal health, it's been it's been the best decision. Um, yeah, I really feel. And, and so, yeah, I have gotten a lot of emails and response from people who are in a tough situation um, with their family and who, who, who have a similar struggle and who just have the same experience of like, well, you know, I didn't choose to grow up in this environment and now I'm here and I'm kind of like growing into being an adult or I have been and, and it's it's a constant struggle. And so I'm really wanting to know what all the options are. And so it's, it's, it's I would say it's still a taboo thing to consider or to do. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's been really rewarding to read those, um, those emails and I, I usually respond and, uh, and I don't, you know, I guess I want to clarify, like, I don't have a kind of a prescriptive view on this. Like, I think it's extremely personal. It's extremely subjective. Um, what's right for one person isn't for the other. And so, you know, that's also why, like, I'm, I'm not really, um, you know, I don't really write about this often. It was just helpful at the time. And I'm, I'm glad I put it out there. Have you maintained the relationship with your sister and her children? Because that Felt like that was the tough bit. Yeah, yeah, that's still hard um, because uh, I grew attached to her children, and then you know it was like, do I, um, you know, where do I draw the line? Uh, and then you know eventually, and and I did talk to other people who made similar decisions to kind of like ask them like, how did things go over the years? And you know, at least um, in in you know it's been what like four years now, three four years. Um, you know, for my own, uh, how should I say, it, you know, as difficult as it was, I made it clear that I was always open uh, if they wanted to reach out to me. Uh, and I'm talking about my, my I guess, w what is the word again? Cousins? Because I always yeah, mix it uh, up. Nieces and nephews? Nieces and nephews, yeah. Um, and so I'm still open for that. Uh, but like, as far as me actively reaching out, uh, I haven't done that. And... Um, yeah, I would say that's that that's been the hardest part where it's like, you know, I um, but I felt that it was important to to make it very clear and complete, at least in the beginning. And then later I can kind of go back and reconsider. And are there particular members of my family that I do want to reach out to? I might, you know, I might decide that later on. But so far, I feel like I'm still 
kind of you know I, I literally I, I feel nervous talking about this like okay. it's, it's really like um, it's um, um, and, and, and I think the nervosity or, or the sensation is kind of like even talking about considering reaching out is anxiety provoking like there's there's definitely stuff there that is related to trauma that I've been through and um, and so yeah it just you know, it's constantly something that, and it's also because of it being a taboo thing, and it is scary for other people to even consider that. Uh, it, you 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 often meet kind of skepsis or people who like I. Anytime there's something online about this, like there's people who will be like, "Oh, well, but why don't you, you know, why don't you live and let live, and you know, you might regret this, and you know, it's who kind of like subtly try to communicate that I might have made the wrong decision." Um, so. Yeah, like it's 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 a valid question to ask. Like, but but the but the way it's worked for me is that I, it's my perspective is hygiene. Like, really, like try to you know, I I would consider I I, I think it's fair to say that I grew up around a lot of um, psychological dysfunction, and so it's hard to then you know not become dysfunctional yourself if you keep being exposed to, to that psychological dysfunction. And so like from that perspective, the hygiene, hygienic decision has been the right one for me. Okay. And the reason I wanted to bring it up is because I'm going to recommend everyone goes to medium and reads pretty much all your posts because there's not a mm. lot over the years, but they're all very important. And then mm. in the middle, there is, this, there is this article though. And I was quite interested to understand why you'd put it out there. Was it for you know, personal cleansing or was it because you hoped it would help others? It was mostly personal. It was really like, you know, it's, it's like this double edged sword of putting things out there in the open. Um, but I think, um, I think it's basically helped me find peace with it. It's like, it was just, you know, doing the exercise of writing it in itself was therapeutic, but then like putting it out there, it, it kind of makes it real. And at the same time, it's potential conversation started. And that's that's what I still think, looking back on it, it's like it's out there, people can see it and read it, make up their own mind. And so, uh, you know, having those people reach out to me over the years, um, it's just been really helpful in terms of like, yeah, like it is an okay thing to do. Like, you know, I am an adult, I make my own decisions. And it, this is the kind of decision that's extremely, you know, difficult, but for some people it's the right thing to do. Like, so it's kind of like doing the opposite of what, what was difficult over the years is that, that this taboo thing of like, you know, I, I to, to break the taboo basically, like for me, that was the most important. Um, and yeah, I mean, I do, you know, looking back and I might do some more writing uh, over time. It, it is, I'm glad that that it's helpful to people, and so it's definitely uh, a, a great a great additional thing that I hadn't really expect would happen. Because it's you know the, one of my articles that gets the most reads, mm. definitely evergreen in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, I do also want to talk to you about Bitcoin. I will mm. share that out though, so you yeah, might get some more people read it and contact you. So, just for those people who don't know you, Arthur, could you just give a little bit about your background um, in terms of? Uh, college because uh, I read that you've got no degree but you uh, mm -hmm. did various classes so your educational background career background and how you've got to where you are now with uh, in crypto and bitcoin yeah so I was always interested in um, philosophy and history like qu quite like academic type um, subjects um, and uh, and so um, I try one of the things that I knew when graduating from high school is like, I really didn't know what I wanted. Like I knew I didn't know. So I did like, I uh, worked for a year as a volunteer in Norway. Um, I started uh, to study African language and culture. Um, then I, I switched to uh, economics and political science. And then uh, being at university, I met some people who uh, were starting a little private school, a K-12 school. So I, I, I jumped on board with that and I helped them uh, do that later. I lived in Holland to do uh, the same thing, starting um, another private school that was K twelve, and then the the academic interest. Like I had some friends, and we were all kind of frustrated with what we were, what we thought we were lacking at university. And so we we founded our own academic institute, which was the Rothbard Institute. So we would translate books and uh, um, um, put together seminars, um, summer university, those kind of things. So that was to me like 
my, I would consider that more than the actual university to be my academic training. And I had some aspirations thinking like, oh, maybe I want to become a professor and I'll, like, I'll just, you know, now that I'm like nearing being 20 years old, I'll like, maybe I'll do that. But then just looking at how, how long that roadmap was and then also meeting professors and seeing them kind of be stuck in tenure and kind of, you know, being in an environment that was not friendly to them. Again, like maybe this hygiene thought of like, well, it's kind of miserable to, to be in that institution and you kind of maybe you can't speak your own mind and those kind of things. So and, and then at the same time, uh, I just my knowledge about the financial system grew and I just grew more worried about, you know, what is going to happen if 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 we get a financial crisis that's severe. And this was before t- 2008. It was really like just reading about the history of banking crises and, and how inflation happens. And then it seemed to me that, yeah, like this is kind of like a, a forest that um, that's very, very dry. And, and it could, you know, it, it could there could be a forest fire and economically speaking in the West and in, in Europe. So that's how I started writing more about current day economic affairs. And then in, in, in 2011, uh, I struck a deal with a publisher and uh, I started my own financial newsletter. And then part of the idea of like trying to, you know, it, it tied in with my own personal experience of, you know, feeling very vulnerable financially because I, I never had a, an education about how to manage money or how to be responsible career wise I, I really felt like I had to do it myself and it was kind of my lifeline like if if I could become financially independent then I could make my own decisions better I could decide where to put my kids in school because I was involved in these private schools and then realizing like oh my god if I keep doing what I'm doing right now I won't even be able to afford sending my kids to a school like this so like um, so I really had to kind of, you know, reinvent myself. Um, so part of that was uh, making trips to Latin America and learning about um, economies that are, um, you know, less burdened with debt, but that uh, have their bouts of crises over the years and then trying to find out, like, what do individuals do to protect themselves against that? It really was my my intention making those trips. And then, of course, it was also maybe I would move to Latin America because I, I knew I wanted to work online. And so in a way, I, I had that freedom. And that's how in 2011, I, I learned about Bitcoin in, in Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. Uh, and then it took me a little while to really kind of be like, yes, this is this is valid technology um, that could help protect people who um, want to be independent. I was already uh, researching gold quite a bit as well. And so uh, I started writing about it and then early 2012 recommended it as an investor investment to my readers. Like we had a a subscription based newsletter and then from 2013 onwards, I just went full time into Bitcoin. Wow. Okay. So quite a journey. And you mentioned 2008 and since then we've had the, it's the largest bull run in history, right? I was. Oh, the the stock market. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny enough, it was on the news last night. And then. And yeah, we have new all time highs, right? New all time highs, new all time highs, uh, longest bull run in history. And they've put it down to a number of factors, but one of the ones is monetary policy. Yeah. Yet behind this, we have increase in debt and an increase in debt burden, especially in the US. Right. So do you feel like there is a potential that this is all going to come crashing down at some point? And this is one of the reasons why people are so interested in Bitcoin is that it won't have, it, it, it's, as people say, like safety says, it's sound money. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, like in, in, in the, um, I need to read up on it again, kind of refresh my memory. But um, in the Roman times, there was this tradition of every time there was a new emperor, uh, you would have a debt jubilee. It was kind of, you know, the debts would be eradicated and people could start from scratch because historically, this is how um, a lot of slavery came into being is that the farmers would have a bad crop. And they'd have to borrow to um, to buy new seeds and, and, and to uh, maybe even rent land. And then if they had a few bad years, they would basically become chronically uh, indebted and then that debt would be transferred to their children, and so you would uh, you would be born in debt and be a slave, right? You'd have your your master that you would have to constantly pay debts to, and over time you would even forget that, uh, you know, there's um there's a particular amount of debt to be owed, and that you could th- you know it would not even be conceivable to pay it off, and so so it's very welcome to have this tradition of debt jubilees. 
Um, and of course, that's that's disappeared, and I don't think that should necessarily be reinstated. But it's just something that happens in in the economy when there's too much debt. Uh, at some point, it just gets eradicated. Either it it is that the the party who owes the money defaults, which is basically saying like, look, I can't pay this anymore. I'm just gonna go bankrupt, and you you can't make that claim anymore. I'm gonna walk away from this, or the um, the money that the debt is owned in owed in the money defaults, so to speak. The money um, has a very high inflation, and then it becomes very easy to just pay off the debt. It's like worth pennies in the end. So so that's that's been my observation is that eventually debt gets wiped out. But the problem that uh, we have in in you know our economy today is that <clears throat> debt has been securitized, wrapped in you know it's been. It's been made into financial instruments, and they're bonds, right? Uh, government bonds, uh, private market bonds, and then those bonds have been bought by pension funds, by uh, endowments, by banks, and so to them, it, they are assets, right? And people count on those bonds to pay their retirements, right? Years and years from now, they count on that, and so if the money that the bonds are expressed in, if that becomes valueless, then all that value gets wiped out. So it's a bond crash. Uh, and so that can happen by defaults, or it can happen if the money inflates or hyperinflates. So that is the kind of looming crisis. Like the debts are too high to ever be paid off. The interest rates are artificially low, which causes the debt to blow up more, to become larger. And at the same time, it's it's kind of a fuse to this bomb because if if at any point interest rates are are uh, pushed up, then it becomes impossible to pay them off. Right? I mean, imagine if you have a million dollar debt. And uh, you you have like a one percent interest on them. It means like what like uh, ten thousand. Uh, if you pay ten thousand uh, dollars a year, then you you uh, you don't incur more debt, right? You, you're flat. But of course, if that interest rate jumps to four or five six percent, all of a sudden it's fifty, sixty, seventy grand that you owe. And if your income doesn't allow for that, then the, the debt is just going to explode in your face. So 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 rising interest rates is very dangerous. And right now, central banks know that they know that governments would just have to default if the interest rate were to go up, and so they choose to just keep printing money, keep the interest rates low. Like I think it's like twelve trillion dollars in debt is already at negative interest rates, which is kind of weird that you know you actually have to pay money to uh, be indebted. Um, and uh, and so I think eventually uh, this 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 process of zero interest rate policy and uh, printing money. Up to up the wazoo is going to lead to very high inflation. So that's kind of my, you know, how I see things happen in the next ten, fifteen years. Um, and it's hard to predict when exactly that'll happen because um, these things tend to take forever until they they all of a sudden happen in a day. But um, I, I I just I, I struggle to see how it's anything else but inevitable. So an inevitable financial crisis on what scale? Bigger than two thousand and eight. It's just a different different type. I think that it'll be more impactful than 2008 because uh, usually what happens when, when there is uh, you know, very severe stagflation, uh, when there is um, a bond market problem, is that banks really get in trouble. And then you, get, you, know, you have to more think about what happened in Argentina in the year 2001 with the Coralito. Uh, basically that um, the government declares a bank holiday and you, you can know it sounds... Sounds kind of nice, but it means that you can no longer access the money in your bank account. They're, they freeze the assets uh, because, you know, usually there's a run on the bank because the way it happened in, in Argentina was that the local debt, uh, local government debt was bought up by the banks and that was backing the bank accounts. And so, but the local government started defaulting on the debt. And so people made the connection. It's like, hey, well, the, you know, these banks all of a sudden are becoming insolvent because those bonds are, are crashing Let's just run and try to withdraw our money. And then, you know, obviously the bank didn't have enough money to pay everyone, um, which is what happened in the movie The Beautiful Life. It's like one of the few movies where you see an actual bank run. And so the government just then just goes like, all right, we'll just close the bank. And then they devalue the currency to uh, relieve the debtors from how much they owe. Uh, it's kind of like uh, kind of a partial default. And then they open up again, but all of a sudden your money is worth way, way less than it was before the bank holiday. So yeah, this is very severe. Like money is like the blood of the economy, and and once that goes wrong, it's it's tough. Like you know, you look at uh, Turkey today, right? Have very high inflation. Uh, Venezuela, like this is really 
it hits very hard. Um, it's, it's like extremely tough medicine. And it usually takes in the West when it happens, hyperinflation, it lasts about one or two years. And then things kind of start slowly normalizing again. Wow. And do you mm. therefore see, are you seeing an alignment between an impending financial crisis and the opportunity mm. for people to protect themselves with Bitcoin? Yeah, like, I, so, I mean, I think this is, you know, I don't want to proclaim that it's absolutely inevitable that we'll have Venezuela style hyperinflation. I think that there is a there is a possibility where we'll have like stagflation, kind of like in the 70s, where inflation is like double digits, but it doesn't go to like absolutely you know insane levels but even so like people's savings will be eroded in, in a situation like that especially the the middle class the working class people that have more cash than you know the wealthy people they can have stocks and things that kind of preserve value over time and gold and those kind of things but so yes i, I do think that um especially for you know like millennials they kind of grew up you know, once they, in their early adulthood, they, they saw the financial crisis happen. And then there was this whole notion, which their parents had always told them like, oh yeah, and you know, invest in real estate and invest in stocks. And it's, you know, and, and then that story kind of had a big crack in it. So I think that many millennials, they've never owned a blue stock chip or a blue chip stock or uh, traditional investments. And so they, they've been kind of, and they've never had a lot of capital either. And so, and they do at the same time see that, the baby boom generation is very huge and is going to be an increasing burden on them, right? They, the millennials are paying, uh, in, in many respects, directly for the pensions of the baby boomers. So it's kind of like, huh, wait a minute, like, you know, what about my pension, right? You know, uh, how do I know that um, my pension is going to be there? And if it is there, how do I know how much these dollars or euros or whatever are going to be worth? So, like, I, I think that, yes, the... Millennials have an appetite for Bitcoin from this point of view. It's kind of like, huh, like I understand the Internet. I understand that there is such a thing as an intangible digital asset. Uh, I was torrenting movies in my teenage years. Like I understand peer to peer. Um, and so I think that um, there is something there where it's like, you know, this is this could be um, something that can hedge potential bad outcomes for me. So like an insurance. On yeah. Fears. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were talking about, I think Pierre Rochard on Twitter was talking about, you know, that uh, people who caution about Bitcoin being a bubble at the same time have no problem recommending that 18 year olds go into debt for a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars to get an education uh, in, in a very insecure job environment. So then, yeah, I brought the suggestion of like, well, maybe you can you can buy one Bitcoin and that can hedge your student debt. All right, maybe ten years from now you can pay off the entire debt with that one Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's guaranteed but you know it's something to consider well i think that there are certainly hints from venezuela and turkey that people do consider bitcoin a hedge or they do see, yeah. consider it a store of value i think ing actually did a did a, a survey uh two months ago and uh in europe uh, they only had like fifteen thousand respondents i think about a thousand in every country uh but at least from that it looked like uh, turkey had the highest bitcoin adoption in europe it was right. like uh, 13 14 percent and we're aware people obviously have been using it in Venezuela. And I think people keep getting lost in this store of value, expecting that uh, a store of value means it's going to hold value in every single country in the world. And, and, right. appreciate or, and it's going to be perfectly stable. Yeah, which is not realistic. But the store of value seems to be when economies are in trouble. And therefore, you, you, I mean, people could come late on like they have with Turkey or people could hedge right now, which yeah. seems like you know, say millennials are. So long term, you're obviously bullish about the opportunity with Bitcoin. Yeah, just to, to jump in on the store of value comment, it's like people don't realize, but like, for example, being in Argentina when the country is locked, locked down, like literally the government knows their currency is being, the value of their currency is being doubted by the entire population and everybody kind of is wanting to get out of the peso. So what they do is they try and ring fence the entire country, prevent money from flowing in and out. So if you're in that situation, what can you do? You can buy some real estate that's crashing. You can buy some stocks, which interestingly that happened in 2012 is that the, the Argentine, Argentine stock market actually had a massive bull run because people were using that mechanism to move money out of the country. They bought right. stocks in Argentina and they sold the same stocks for dollars in the US. 
Um, and so having Bitcoin, even if Bitcoin goes down 20 or 30 percent temporarily, it's still something that you can spend abroad. You can travel abroad, you can spend it. And you couldn't do that with you. You cannot do it with cash dollars, which you know they might get taken from you at the border. Uh, you cannot. You cannot take gold on your person. Um, and then if you try and send pesos abroad, the government is going to give you a forty percent penalty. Like so. So those are things to keep in mind from our Western point of view. Is like same in India, same in so many other countries that have capital controls. Like it's not just the the monetary value or volatility that's a factor. It's also like. Is this something liquid that I can carry with me, that I can spend when I'm abroad? Can I send it to my kids who live abroad? Can my kids send the money to me? Like Those are all factors that have to be taken into account, I think. So obviously, long term, <clears throat> a more stable Bitcoin price would be better. Yeah. But I guess uh, it's difficult for Bitcoin to be stable in every con- country when there's different uh, interest rates, different uh, <clears throat> appreciation devaluations of currencies. Therefore, at the moment, the main, the primary use case. Therefore, I, I see the two is is uh, for people to uh, protect value in struggling economies, but also future insurance in even in Western economies. Then, which is pretty interesting, um, which is therefore a very bullish long term view. Um, but also at the same time, you are still short term bearish. Yeah, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin has these cycles, like it's a, it's a startup currency, like, you know, it, it doesn't have the properties that, you know, we think it can have a few years from now, and it probably will have. Um, and, so, and at the same time, these, the, the attention to Bitcoin, it comes in waves, it's driven by uh, the price is a signal that people pick up on. And so when a lot of people buy Bitcoin, it gets in the news and then more people come in and more people buy it. Even if they don't understand it, they will have some exposure. And then when the price goes down, all of a sudden it feels like a very different asset. (laughs) I bought this asset that I thought was going to only go up and now all of a sudden it's going down aggressively and I panic and I sell. And and so, you know, Bitcoin adoption happens in these waves and we've seen uh, three big ones so far. And I think it'll, it'll keep happening that way, even though the actual volatility is going to f- slow down. But really, it's, it's, you know, it's different than, for example, the radio as a technology. When that was adopted, if more people wanted it, the uh, manufacturers could just make more of them. But you can't do that with Bitcoin. You cannot make more Bitcoins. Of course, we've seen this proliferation of altcoins. Like people can create kind of like knockoffs, but they don't have the same properties. They have a lot more risks involved with them. And so uh, it, it's just the way it goes. Adoption happens in cycles. And so, yeah, we've just come down of this gigantic um, rise in price. Like people don't realize often, but the bottom of the bull phase, the, the very start of the bull phase was uh, over 30 months ago. Uh, no, over 30 months before the peak, right? The peak was $20,000 in December, January, um, about eight months ago. You have to go back 30, 35 months to find the very beginning of that rally. And that was when Bitcoin was $150. So we went from $150 all the way to $20,000. And so I think it's only reasonable that the market just needs some time to like digest that. And like, man, what just happened here? And let the dust settle. And mm-hmm. then regulators are going to have some things to say. And people need to pay some taxes. And, and, and people have also bought, you know, they kind of thrown Bitcoin together. Leap, uh, how do you say that? Lumped it. Lumped it, exactly. Lumped it together with all these other coins. They bought a basket. And so now they feel horrified that some of these coins are down 85, 95%. And so I think often they throw Bitcoin away with the bathwater. It's kind of like, you know, they're kind of just a little disgusted and they need they need a break. So that's why, yeah, I'm, I'm not super bullish for the rest of the year. I think uh, we could see lower prices. Price could go sideways for a while. But then, you know, there's going to be a huge catalyst going forward. We're going to we're going to likely see a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, Bitcoin supply is going to be cut in half by 2020. I don't know if you've talked about that to your listeners. A little bit, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if that would just be gradually priced in rather than a dramatic single event. I, I wasn't involved during the previous halving. Yeah, it was actually a catalyst. It was a pretty strong catalyst because people realized, like, huh, the, the, the previous um, annual increase in supply was 12% before the previous happening and the 12% got cut down to 6%. And then uh, right now what's going to happen is we're going to go from five, I think, to about two and a half percent. And so I think the market understands that, you know, miners are 
overall, as a whole, pretty agnostic to Bitcoin. They just mine the coins and they sell them into the market. I'm not saying when there's a there's a very strong rally, usually they hoard more coins, but then they will sell more on the way down. So, you know, the net is that they're actually pretty flat Bitcoin. So all that supply just gets dumped onto the market. And so I do think it's, you know, and 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 uh, the market feels that. Well, all this, like imagine if, it's hard to say, you know, there are, if oil production would get cut in half, like oil prices would obviously go up. Like, you know, so it's kind of similar to something like that. And the market knows this. Uh, but I mean, the market just needs stories. You know, it's just a story that will likely drive the price up, right? It doesn't mean that, it's not a mechanical thing. Like this, there's always psychology in markets. And so I just, you know, I look at that and it's real, but it's also, I think, going to be a story, the story of the ETF as well. Uh, but at the same time, it's real because it'll Bitcoin will become accessible to so many more people in such an easy way and the funds and et cetera, et cetera. Next up, I talk to Tour about what he thinks are the most important things coming up for Bitcoin. But before that, a message from another one of my show sponsors. So this is really for my US listeners, as I want to talk to you about Stamps.com, who approached us to advertise on the podcast, which is really, really cool. So you know what, guys, these days you can pretty much get anything on demand. Even my podcast, you might be listening to this the day it's released, or you might be listening to it a week later, a month later, who knows. But you have the convenience of listening to it whenever it suits you. And did you know you can also get your postage on demand with Stamps.com? I didn't. I don't have this in the UK. So this is pretty cool, right? With Stamps.com, you can access all their services off the post office right from your desk. That's it, right? You can buy and print real US postage for any letter or any package right from your home. It's all available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just go to their website, click print, mail, and you're done. That's stamps.com. You can even weigh your letters and packages and print the exact postage at the exact time you need it. So I'm not sure about you guys, but I still go to the post office. I still queue up and have my packages weighed and ready to post. With stamps.com, you don't need to do this. So if you're wasting your time with this, then I recommend you go and check out the website and save yourself a whole bunch of time. And right now, they have a special offer for you. They have a four-week trial, which includes postage and a digital scale. So don't wait. Go to stamps.com and... Up in the top right-hand corner, you will see a radio microphone. Click on that and type in Bitcoin to get your special offer. That's stamps.com with a special offer of Bitcoin. And what do you think are some of the most important things for Bitcoin adoption over the next few years? We've obviously got, um, you've talked about uh, ETFs coming. Uh, Yeah. I expect we'll get a, another dinner of today, and uh, but at some point between now and, and next year, we'll, we'll, one will be approved. Uh, and interesting, I'd also love to know your view on Caitlin Long's comments. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them, right. um, but obviously, uh, uh, financial products will open the market to is, is more institutional investors or wider institutional yeah. investors. Also, the technology, uh, you know, better wallets with Lightning Network will have increased uh, 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 faster payment net, uh, payment opportunities. And then also education, just educating people about Bitcoin. What do you find are, are out of those kind of three areas? What are most important or is it all just important for you? Well, I think that the, the, uh, they, they all interplay. I think... Um, I think Trace Mayer is, uh, you know, he, he identified correctly these like seven um, drivers to the, the, the Bitcoin price over time, Bitcoin adoption. And, um, and, and, and they're all factors that are tailwinds and they kind of, they, they complement each other. So one of the things that I think is underestimated so far is that is the amount of financialization that will happen around Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is... You know, there's going to be Bitcoin futures, Bitcoin options, Bitcoin ETFs, Bitcoin, you know, and so and so Bitcoin will become a part of um, what institutional institutions invest in, like insurance companies, uh, endowments, eventually uh, pension funds. And I think that'll be more than is visible now. That'll be the strongest part of Bitcoin adoption in the next 10 years. I think that baby boomers will not so much have Bitcoin on their phone I think they will be exposed to it even without them knowing it. It'll be their insurance company all of a sudden owns Bitcoin. It'll be their pension funds that has it, those kind of things. Uh, so when we're talking about how do we go from 2 or 5% adoption today to 70 or 80%, I think that'll be the main driver. And of course, at the same time, the fact that Bitcoin is decentralized, the fact that 
uh, Lightning Network is going to grow and grow and that uh, we'll have this trustless way of interacting with Bitcoin is, um, is going to validate the main proposition, the main idea that this is censorship resistant. Like it'll, it'll like, that'll be the cutting edge where we'll see all these applications that over and over will prove that, yeah, it's, you can't really mess with Bitcoin. You can try, you can try and hijack it. You can try and, you know, make a better Bitcoin or something like that. Well, you'll probably fail. And so uh, I think there'll there'll be this, in a way, it'll seem like two different worlds, but they will strengthen each other. It's like, the fact that ETFs exist, the fact that um, insurance companies own it, own it, they will legitimize the more you know radical use cases. Just like with the internet, where it's like the fact that banks plugged in and became online, the fact that governments started coming online, it it legitimized the kind of things that people were scared of. It's like oh my god, online gambling or all these like weird opinions, or you can be anonymous on the internet. It's kind of like you know, they both complemented each other. And I think the similar thing is going to happen with uh, with Bitcoin adoption. And uh, so, yeah, I'm excited about both. Absolutely. Wow. And as I mentioned before, I, I noticed you shared um, a section from a Tamas Blummer article. Uh, I'll just quote it. I argue in this writing that central bank central bank controlled digital currencies will soon challenge Bitcoin. The main motivation there is to allow for sustained and significant negative interest rates. So I've got two questions there. Um but the first question really relates to um, central bank controlled digital currencies being a threat to Bitcoin. So we obviously have our first uh, in Venezuela. We have the Petro. It's obviously a shit coin. <laughs> it's obviously something <laughs> we can't be trusted. Um, but it's happened. And obviously we've seen stories about other countries and other governments considering uh, central bank issued cryptocurrencies which will never be able to be trusted as much as Bitcoin, but they are still a potential threat. Can you explain why? Yeah, I have a tweet that's out there, and, and I've kind of made it into a thread over time. And it says uh, the, the period of 2018 to 2020 is going to be the hold my beer phase for governments and uh, Fortune 500 companies. And the idea is that they're all going to launch their own currencies. Like before, it was like ICOs were scrappy and they were like, you know, kind of scammy and startupy, and and and, but at the same time, there was this massive amount of money that went around in it. So I think that this is this is being observed and watched. And I think that you know, in some way, it's very interesting how it, it's kind of a it's kind of a all of a sudden, central banks are no longer the king of the world, right? They have to start having some humility that competition exists and that when consumers make their decisions about which currency to use or to save in, now they have more choice than they had before. And so, you know, just to think about um, central banks issuing digital currency, it's probably not going to be a cryptocurrency, right? Because it won't be decentralized, but they'll try to build in some features that people like, maybe like auditability, maybe like inflation control or, you know, whatever they think that people might want, which I think is great. And and I don't know if, if you'll agree or the, the audience will agree, but but recently I watched this interview, which came out, which was with, uh, with John Cleese and um, I forget who, who the, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Palin. Michael Palin, and it was right when uh, The Life of Brian came out, which was is this movie that is kind of a, you know, a, 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 a Jesus story. Um, how do you call it? A, kind of a caricature of yeah. the Jesus story. And so they had asked them about it. And it was, I think it was in 1979. And they actually had two members, uh, very prominent members of the, the Anglican Church also come in. Uh, I think it was a bishop and another person. And, and the way these two individuals were talking about that movie and that it was you know so uh, so horrific and that they were kind of um they were um they were um um uh, poisoning the minds of these young impressionable kids with that movie and and also the even the tone that they had they just you know it was really kind of an, an arrogance that oozed from that and 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 I think it was that they came from a position where they just always had that monopoly. You know, they had the monopoly on the the kind of the the the, the public and uh, the the um, this authority position of authority. And so I think that we see the, some of the things that we hear from central bankers now kind of come from that same place where they just assume that this is all just kind of um, 
you know, something in the margin and will never get anywhere. And so I can just talk, talk down on it. And I think that tone is going to gradually change, just like how the tone of the church, uh, whatever you, however you define that, has kind of mildened and become a bit more, um, a bit more um, 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 humble over, over, over the years. I don't know if that makes sense to you. No, no, it does. And, um, you know, we have seen a changing narrative. We have seen, and not just from central banks, we've seen it from, we've seen it from JP Morgan. We've seen it from Goldman <clears> Sachs. <throat> Um, we've seen a recognition that they this, this isn't going away and, and it is part of our economy and people do want to own it. Where I struggle with um, central bank cryptocurrencies is that I already really have a digital currency with pa- my pound. I can spend it on my card. I can move it from bank account to bank account. Yeah. So unless they create a Bitcoin-type clone, a, a government altcoin, I struggle to understand what is the point of them creating a cryptocurrency. Right. right. Yeah. So um, I think I mean like different schools of thought. Um, <clears throat> like if you read papers uh, written by the Bank for International Settlements, um, the, the IMF, and this goes back, I found papers that went back all the way to 1996 about, you know, because theoretically people knew that this is possible to create a digital currency that's private, private market based. And so what you see there is concern about um, uh, seigneurage. Like basically, if you have the monopoly of a currency, uh, then you can generate revenues for yourself and that's your income. So, uh, which is, you know, the, the money that some of the money that central banks create, they keep for themselves or they benefit the government because central bank will buy the government debt, right? And then finances the government in that way. So they were afraid that, look, if this really catches on, we could lose that income. Uh, so that's kind of the place where, where they're coming from. And you see this when, you know, originally in the 19th century, you know, we were on a gold standard. So, so governments were disciplined because they could not... They cannot just create new gold, uh, but eventually uh, the the paper that the gold was backed by was kind of like um, detached, and, and they actively worked to detach that. And so, uh, what you saw happen in the the forties, fifties, and sixties is that even though the the U.S. Um, uh, officially was on a gold standard, only very large banks and governments were able to redeem paper dollars for gold. And so, uh, General de Gaulle did that. The French. Uh, um, um, you know, the, the, the leader of France, he actually kept redeeming physical gold and put it in the French vaults for the dollars that they had. And this was a problem because the U.S. gold was being depleted. And so that's why in the early 70s, Nixon closed the gold window and cut the tie between. So from then on, nobody could redeem uh, dollars for gold anymore. Uh, but uh, so gold kind of was this thorn in, in the, the heel of, um, of, of, of governments because it was kind of a, ble- you know, it performed better than, than, uh, than the dollar. And so um, there is literature on this where the founders of the euro they were thinking about this since the 60s. Uh, one author is Alexandre Lamphalusi, uh, who is considered to be the godfather of the euro. He has this uh, paper in the 60s where he's talking about the, the demonetization of gold and how do we do that. And so my interpretation of that effort is that they created the euro to kind of create this spectacle where the dollar was going to compete with the euro and then people would kind of forget about gold, right? Rather than have the gold compete with the dollar, and that is kind of an obvious win for gold because it's obviously scarce, we'll create this like, so it's kind of a, in some way, it's like a, a you create this straw man that people can then root for or root against. And, and, and they've done that, right? And then at the same time, there was the London gold pool where um, uh, central banks would come together and actively try and control the gold price by strategically uh, selling uh, gold reserves into the market and depressing the price. Uh, and then, of course, by the year 2000, 2004, they were kind of exhausted. And that's why the gold price has recovered. So, so this is a kind of a long story that I'm telling you. But, but so I think that for, for central banks to support or create a digital currency that is a little bit more Bitcoin-like, it would maybe create the same story where it's like the dollar versus their own currency. And then people would be distracted by that and kind of, you know, not want to go into Bitcoin so much anymore. So maybe it would be a Bitcoin airdrop or something like that. And so I think that's possible. And I think the other route that uh, is, I think, likely eventually to happen, maybe even more likely, is a kind of a central bank for Bitcoin where, um, you know, um, 
Bitcoin exchanges, they occasionally will get in trouble. Either they will uh, have fractional reserve, which we saw happen in the, the wildcat banking era in the 19th century, where banks would emit more gold certificates than they had gold in their vaults, and then there was a bank run. And then, you know, the emperor had no clothes, they didn't have enough, they, they would have to go bankrupt. So you had these occasional crises. And uh, so that's how actually the Federal Reserve Act was, was uh, conceived. There was a, a series of bank runs in 1907. Banks went, went bankrupt and the government was like, hey, we can no longer allow this. So let's just pool all the gold in a central repository in several. And that's going to be the network of Federal Reserve banks. And then those are going to be the insurers of the private bank. So whenever a private bank can, gets in trouble, they'll get a bailout from the central system. And so I think that something like that is very conceivable where... You know, the government will mandate, and I'm not saying I'm advocating for this at all, right? I think that would actually add significant vulnerability to, um, you know, it, it, the crises would happen less frequently, would, would, would be a lot, you know, more severe, right? If, if the central bank of Bitcoin gets hacked, imagine, right? All people's real Bitcoin that gets stolen, that would really be a huge problem. So, so but I do think that, that that kind of thinking is something that we'll see the next 10 years, there'll be a lot of um, a lot of word about that. Because right now, that's what institutions worry about is like, I want to get involved in Bitcoin, but are my deposits insured? And how, how, how do you insure an asset that increases in value on average by like 40, 50% a year, right? Who wants to, to do that? So self-insurance, which is what happens in the security sector, um, uh, which is the DTCC system, uh, basically... Uh, a share in Facebook or Google or any kind of company, it's it has to be scarce. You can't just replicate that. So you need a system to keep those certificates secure. Uh, and people do that with clearing houses. And it's kind of a network that where the, the big players insure each other right. rather than that they, they outsource that work to one insurance company because then you have this additional vulnerability. So, so I think that'll be the struggle is like, are we going to have this Federal Reserve Central Bank of Bitcoin or is it going to be more a voluntary-based system where uh, the big players kind of have each other's back and, and there's no subsidies involved or there's not a huge amount of government involved? Or maybe a third one that I'm not thinking of because there's a lot more possible in Bitcoin with multi-sig and, and time locks. So there could be this market-based solution that doesn't really look like DTCC today that could be like, you know, kind of a joker card. Uh, but anyway, like that that's where... Or, know, this is my thoughts on where the regulators' minds are at. Or Bitcoin could just end bank bailouts. Um, well, I think that yes and no. Because yes, I, to some extent, because Bitcoin is highly auditable. Like with Bitcoin, you can you can basically put pressure on an exchange or a Bitcoin bank and say, "Hey, like, come on, don't kid me, okay." The Bitcoin blockchain is the most transparent database on the planet. Surely you can point us to where these assets are, or you can somehow prove cryptographically that you control those assets so that you, you, you show that you have all the reserves, that you didn't go behind our backs and lend it out to somebody else to make some profit on the side. So it's, it's it, it, at least in theory, highly transparent. And then also executing a bank run is a lot easier because... You can wire the money to anywhere in the world. Whereas if, if you're dealing with the peso in Argentina, you try the bank run. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to withdraw physical pesos? And then who's going to want to accept that? What are you going to exchange it for? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you're in Turkey and you want to do a run on your Bitcoin bank, you can send it. Once it's in your wallet, you send it to a family member who's 5,000 miles away in a flash. Right. So, so you can... There's a lot more vigilance possible from the saving population. I think that is going to diminish the severity of future financial crises. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. One of the other things I noticed um, going through some of your old articles hmm. is um, your very early articles on Ethereum. Um, your, you were saying things that people are starting to say now hmm. about it. And I noticed one of your articles, uh, you were short. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you were you were wrong in terms of the financial bet. Actually, Ethereum went down seventy percent against Bitcoin after I published that. Oh, did it really? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking more long term. But of course, if you look at the long term, yeah, yeah. Went up, but actually, that was a profitable trade for me. And I was also looking at the dollar value of uh, Ethereum from then. So, because yeah. I think the network was what one and a half billion or something right. then. But do you feel a little bit vindicated now with your? Yeah, I mean the. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm, I'm, I'm even seeing, um, you know, a hedge fund who uh, who just had this forty page report about why they're short Ether versus Bitcoin. Um, my best trade of this year was to short Ether versus Bitcoin. Like, so it's something like I've been, tr- you know, I've been trying to separate fundamental analysis from the narrative that's alive in the market, right? And so markets can be wrong for long periods of time. If you look yeah. at, for example, Theranos, this you know huge scandal, huge fraud. It it, it, it it that company was alive for twelve years. You know, Enron was was up and running for many years uh, before they went bankrupt and and went up in flames. So so something I'm trying to be aware of is that you you know like what Keynes says is that you can be um, what is again the the market can, can be wrong for a lot longer than you can stay solvent, yeah. right? But so yeah, in terms of vindication, I, I'm just seeing market can be irrational. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Exactly. Irrational. So, um, but yeah, like my concern was, how is this going to scale? There's probably some other points that you've seen there. It was about how does this work with multiple implementations? Like people are are, are saying that it's a positive thing to have all these different clients that supposedly run the same network. But what if they conflict? Um, Also about the vulnerabilities of these smart contracts I was concerned about. Um, and so all these things we've see, we see Ether run into and still like, I don't know how long it's been, like two or three years, there is still absolutely no clear path to scaling for Ether today. And that was my biggest concern is that, you know, something can work in the short term, but then if you think it through, it's like, how is like Yahoo, right? Yahoo was one of those search engines that worked in the short term, but it was all human powered. It was humans that were, that were parsing through the internet and making these portal websites and of course, that's absolutely not scalable. It was successful for a while, and they got a lot of revenues because all the startups were advertising on Yahoo. But once Google came around and they had an actually scalable solution, they just they crushed Yahoo. And so that's kind of that's a metaphor I think works pretty well for me. Where, where Bitcoin was slower, just like Google. Google was a search engine number twenty one to to go live on the internet. So I agree with a lot of what you say, and I understand it. It takes people. I think it takes other people some time to get their heads around this, but. Do you see any value in any of the work that Ethereum or any of these other protocols have been doing? Anything they've developed? Any any other value? Yeah, uh, I mean, with Ethereum, I struggle because the 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 main premise, um, in my opinion, was this architectural flaw: the idea that um, the rejecting the notion that if you want to build something complex. You start with something simple and you bolt on another simple thing and another, and then and then each of those modules has a different function, uh, and that's how you scale. That's how you create complexity that's sustainable and robust. That notion was rejected from early on. Like Vitalik had a lot of feedback from very smart, very accomplished people that he rejected, and so in a way, because of that, um, I think people who just had a long term view and who were very had a high pedigree and very accomplished. They just kind of backed off and be like, you know, okay, uh, you know, I, I, I'll do my own thing or I'll focus on Bitcoin or something. Like Andrew Poolstrap, for example, he had a great paper on uh, proof of stake and, and other altcoin uh, ideas in 2014-15. And that was just ignored. So he was like, all right, I'll just, you know, do my thing and work with people that, that do, that do uh, agree on this modular idea. And, and, you know, if you look at how the internet is layered, it's just, you know, that there's a stack of protocols. Uh, if you look in biology, that's also, it's extremely modular where everything has its own specific function and everything then works together eventually. So, yeah, with Ethereum, I really struggle. Uh, if anything, it's, it's you know, showing the market what doesn't work, which, you know, there's some value there. Um, and also there was some signals uh, where there was definitely a demand for uh, securitizing uh, or, or like for, for startups or organizations to basically sell a part of the ownership in, in their enterprise in a less bureaucratic way. Uh, and, and then in terms of, you know, other protocols, um, I think that, so so fundamentally, modularity uh, is, is, is just sound, in my opinion. Uh, proof of work is also sound. Uh, I think anything else, pretty much anything else is voting. Like you can summarize a proof of proof of stake is a voting system. Uh, and voting is, is, you know, in essence, a political solution. And I think we've seen over time that, you know, political solutions are not robust over centuries. Like, you know, it had the, there's now these, these theories that under the Sphinx in, in, um, in, in Egypt, under the pyramids, they were actually, 
there was a library they were trying to preserve knowledge for the ages or some kind of secret or of course if it's a burial site you're trying to preserve that so if you if we imagine like had the the Egyptians built some kind of political hierarchy it's like we're going to vote and we'll have these guards and then uh, you know we'll try to get consensus and this and that way you know somehow uh, some at some point after three four thousand years somewhere in that line that would that would have broken down but what they did instead was they built this giant pile of rocks on top of it which is proof of work right i mean you you need a certain amount of work to remove that and nobody bothered and so the secret was actually preserved it's kind of an illustration that proof of work and in, in uh, biology you also see all kinds of, of uh, proofs of that so yeah i, I think I, when i look at protocols i want to see that it's built on sound principles and i also look at the involvement of uh, the engineers like i want to see that there's engineers who have significant achievements in areas that are relevant. So peer-to-peer protocols, uh, it could be the, the the backbone of the internet. I want them to, to have some serious achievements there. Um, I want them to have achievements maybe in like um, memory compression because a blockchain is, you know, bloat is almost the biggest enemy of a blockchain. You, it has to be lean and, and, and that's how it gets decentralized. Um, maybe also in mathematics or cryptography. I want to see those achievements and then I'll pay attention. And then I also want to see some Bitcoin developers that somehow have, you know, done some peer review or endorsed or because really Bitcoin is so difficult. Um, and, 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 so, and, and it's like such a fine line to walk on to try and do this because you're creating a database that uh, is going to be copied. You're going to store everything forever. That's like crazy. Like, why would you do that? So it's mm-hmm. kind of like, but Bitcoin, there's a there's a there's strong enough reason to try that because you're going to store billions of dollars worth of value. So it does make sense. So so those are kind of the things that I look at. And so do you think governance protocols are kind of overrated? I think it, it's it's almost an oxymoron to me. Where it's like a governance protocol doesn't that imply some kind of political mechanism to make decisions? Like well, I, I remember t- having uh, somebody pitch Dash to me for quite a long time. And it was this idea like, oh, we're all going to vote and it's kind of democratic. And like, I think, first of all, I don't see any large publicly traded companies that have democratic decision making. Like, in, of course, there's, there's signals from the market, right? The people vote with their money. But when it comes to design decisions, like, you know, Ford didn't ask the market, what should I make? Because they would have told him, make me a better horse carriage. Like he, you know, did his own thing and then people voted with their money and then he built more stuff because he, he was a visionary. Um, so do you think governance protocols are ignoring the fact that a lot of advancements in technology and innovation has come from leadership? Yeah, I think so. And I don't think I don't. Yeah, I think so. And also there's just a certain mindset that is just requires a lot of maturity. I really don't mean like anything like charisma or anything like that. I mean, like technological leadership where you really know the direction to, to make something sustainable. And, and so they, you have this engineering community, this open source community, this whole process that you, where you iterate very slowly and, and kind of like the way Bitcoin Core does it, right? It's a, it's a decentralized community, but, but, or Linux, like Linux is robust. Uh, imagine if you were to like have public polls on like, what is the next feature we need in Linux? Like this, the, a lot of the value would go lost because you, you, you know, the people have no idea what might undermine the fundamental value proposition if they voted on it. So, so I'm very wary of voting when it comes to protocols. Like I think, you know, in the long term, you make a product and then the market will decide, do I want it or reject it? But don't let the market literally decide, hold your pen for you or hold your engineering, you know, your keyboard for you. It's therefore that I think the point you're making, which I agree with, is uh, in these scenarios, not all votes are equal in terms of the where the where the vote is coming from, not in that there's an equal number of votes. Do you understand right. what I'm making? Right. If people are, for example, if we all voted on the next uh, feature for Bitcoin that should be looked at, uh, it could be a very the the development could be very different because they're, they're yeah. going to come with different aspects. It's yeah, good like that the average person's time preference is is lower than yeah. a, a bitcoin developer who's been working on it for 15 years and who's invested in it and whatever like they have a, a longer time horizon i think like maybe like a platform like reddit shows a little bit the, the weakness of every making everything vote based because the, the top upvoted you know uh posts or comments 
are not necessarily the ones that will reflect scientific truth. It's just, you know, it agrees with whatever the average person agrees with, right? Mm-hmm. And which doesn't mean that Reddit has no value, but, you know, it, it, you know, it, it, if it was so powerful, you, we would just see, um, uh, what's his name again, the new Apple CEO, like, or, or Jeff Bezos, he would just go to Reddit and be like, all right, Reddit, what should be the next Amazon product? And everybody would vote, and then he would just do that, and it would be the best, like, there's a reason why CEOs don't do that because mm-hmm. the, the market doesn't always know what it wants or it doesn't always know how to make something sustainable. I don't know. And I think a lot of people from where I'm from would argue Brexit is the result of a similar prob- problem, false information, wrong information, perhaps something we shouldn't have had a, uh, a vote on. Yeah, it's very, it gets hard when you, when you start thinking, you know, implementing it or, or thinking about like, you know, uh, real life politics because, I think it's a different arena uh, because, like, to me, cryptocurrencies and all these things and the internet, there's like there are no barriers, there's no geography, and so um, just as well as you invite votes from the world, one attacker can pretend to be a million people. Like, you can have civil attacks. Like, these are all vulnerabilities to political system. That's why proof of work, I think, is so valuable. It's just like. All right, you want influence? You do the work. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's no way to spoof that. Whereas, like, if if you do, like, you know, one way that I often explain Bitcoin is like, well, people have this idea that you could, um, you know, uh, have a decentralized way of making decisions on 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 what is a valid transaction and what is not. So, like, what if everybody with an IP address could vote? But then immediately you run into this problem, like, well, yeah, but you could have. Um, uh, botnets that pretend to be five million addresses, and they have five million IP addresses, and they attack the network that way. That's that's you know, it's a valid attack vector for any kind of proof of stake system. And it's it's I don't think you can really the only way that you can you can um, make it a little more robust is to um, to add more work. Like literally, all these penalties that they try and build into is like basically obfuscated proof of work. Right. And and it's similar if you. Um, you know, the way they try to prevent um, uh, political problems is that uh, y- you build in all these rules to prevent political attacks. Well, in a way, that's also work. Like, you're introducing work into what originally was this pure vote-based system. Like, it, it, you know, there's... I think work is just this, m- you know, meritocracy. It, it, it is something that has worked for thousands of years. It's it's why markets work. I, I, do you know what? We've, um, <clears throat> we've come to... A, 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 Probably a, actually, we've done over an hour. Um, but um, uh, what I would say is my overriding thought from this interview is all roads lead back to Bitcoin. Well, yeah, I, I want to be careful to not be dogmatic, yeah. uh, but I do think that it's it's important to like um, look at technology and try to take a step back and like what are the underlying principles that make something work or valuable, and then you know from that framework look at today and it's like all right, what makes sense. And so for me, so far, Bitcoin makes sense. I do think there are iterations on proof of work who might be interesting and might be complementary to Bitcoin. There are some privacy innovations that will either be integrated in Bitcoin or be it, their own protocols. So I, I want to be, just be careful. Like I, I'm, I'm very aware, like I'm an early Bitcoin adopter. Like I could have this survivor's bias, right? Where, you know, Bitcoin is great because I know about it and all the new stuff, ah, you know, like that's how... That's how old people think. Like yeah. you, you just, your brain isn't flexible enough to learn about everything, and so you kind of reject it outright. I, I just want to be careful to not do that, and um, you know, more power to anyone who can, you know, improve upon Bitcoin in any way. I think, you know, the overall thing that I'm excited about is just to have this free market in, in money. It's just, um, it amazes me. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, this has been absolutely great. I would love to do it again in the future. Um, just before I close out, any final thoughts and uh, how can people find you? And I'll obviously share everything out in the show sure. notes, but uh, let them know. I just Google my name. I think the top link is uh, my Twitter account, which is Tour de Meister, uh, and then uh, my Medium account, I think, is number two. Okay, well, I'll share it out. But thank you so much, Arthur. It's been uh, great having you on. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, what did you make of that? Did you enjoy that as much as I did? Chur really was such a nice guy, and it was really interesting to hear him open up about something that was clearly very personal and how it's helped others. So I do encourage you to check the article out. It is in the show notes, but also check out all his other articles. It was also great to listen to him talk about Bitcoin and his thoughts on the scaling issues around Ethereum. 
I really enjoy his perspective. And please do check out some of the other things he's written and do obviously follow him on Twitter. I will share out all his links in the show notes. Just a couple of thanks. Uh, just to thank you again to Spencer from Blockchain Capital for letting us use his studio to record this. And also, I just want to say thanks to my engineer, Jason Camiolo. He always uh, gets my shows ready on time, even when I send things over to him at the last minute. If you've got any sound engineering needs, please do check out um, his website. I'll share his details in the show notes. Please do support the show. If you can leave me a review on iTunes, that would be great. Five star if you think it deserves it. Please do follow me on social media. My handle is at what Bitcoin did on everything, on Steemit, on Instagram, on Medium, on Twitter. Please do check out my website. It is www.whatbitcoindid.com. And please do feel free to email me. I do pretty much reply to anyone, as long as it's not nonsense. So please feel free to email me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And please do share out the show with your friends and family. I'm going to be flying back to London on Sunday. I've had a great three weeks here in California. I've met some great people. It really, really has been an amazing time. And I'm looking forward to getting back here as soon as possible. And yeah, thanks to everyone who's hosted me. Thanks to everyone who's met up with me. And uh, I hope you all have a great week. Mm -hmm.